please help me welcome Paul Harding. Thank you kindly. Thank you for coming out tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, politics and prose is one of those. Uh, this is my first time here. And politics and prose is one of those, you know, when you're out on the circuit and you run into all the other authors and they ask you, like, all the famous bookstores you've read at. And I've always had to say, no, I've never read it, politics and prose. And it's like admitting you've never read, like, Dostoevsky or something. Everybody goes, what? <laughs> you know, so whew, here I am, finally. It's taken a long, taken a long time. So, um, so I figured uh, what I'd like to do uh, for you is read uh, for maybe, you know, 20 minutes and then afterwards um, take questions and um, constructive criticism. Um, I, don't, I don't think you need to know too, too much about it. Enon, the title of the book, Enon, is, the, uh, is actually the name of the village in which the novel takes place. Um, the protagonist is Charlie Crosby, who's the grandson of George Crosby from Tinkers. The basic dramatic premise of the book is that Charlie has lost his only child, his daughter Kate. She's 13 years old, and she's um, struck down while she's riding her bike one afternoon um, just before she begins the ninth grade. Um, and the novel, the time frame of the novel is the, um, from the time of her death to about the first anniversary of her death. And um, I think the only thing you need to know for what I'm going to read is that not uh, right after uh, Kate, his daughter, dies, um, in a moment of anger, Charlie punches a wall and breaks um, a bunch of bones in his hand, so he refers to that. Um, otherwise, I think it's, it's self-explanatory. I walked all afternoon through the woods and hidden meadows of Enon. The sun went down and dusk spread and darkness began to fall. At one point, it occurred to me that I had not eaten anything, but I felt neither hungry nor very thirsty. I reached the western shore of Enon Lake as the last light left the sky. I knelt down by the water and raised my broken hand above my head so it wouldn't get wet and cupped some water in my good hand and took a couple sips. The water was cold and clean tasting, fine, mineral. I swallowed two pills with another mouthful. He's been given a prescription of painkillers, which he begins to take more and more like candy. Um, I swallowed two pills with another mouthful of water, then jogged across the street and into the trees on the other side of the road, at the edge of one of Enon's two nine-hole golf courses. The cemetery was a quarter mile away, back toward the village. It lay between the two golf courses along the flank of a large hill. The golf courses and cemetery begin on flat tracks directly off the old post road to Boston, which then steeply elevate in a succession of rises. I crossed the near golf course and stepped over the stone wall into the upper part of the cemetery. Kate was buried below, toward the front, in the family plot, next to my grandfather, George Washington Crosby, and my grandmother, Norma Crosby, and my mother, Betsy Crosby, and where I will be buried when I die. My great-grandmother, Kathleen Crosby, is also buried in the cemetery in another section. It was just superstition, but I did not want to pass in front of Kate's grave. Without having paid attention, I realized I had taken at least twice as many pills as I ought to have, and maybe more. It almost felt as if I were levitating when I stopped walking and stood still and looked down through the shadows to where Kate's stone was. The moon was out, and there was a beautiful view from the top of the cemetery. Deer browsed on the golf greens below to my right, and the tombstones made of white marble glowed. A corner of the lake was visible below, past the road beyond the trees, sparkling. I sat and surveyed the land and looked down the hill toward the Norway maple under which my grandparents and my mother and my daughter lay. A stupor fell over me, and I floated without direction for some time, possibly hours, until I was roused by the voices of two young girls. They were sitting 15 yards away from me, to my left, cross-legged, face to face, hidden from the road behind an enormous rectangular white headstone, on the other side of which, as I knew from my many trips to read the inscriptions on both the cemetery's prominent memorials and its modest ones, lay a family of six named Smith, all of whom had died during an epidemic in 1839. The girls shared a cigarette and swapped a bottle of wine. They both bent forward to examine something on the ground between them. 
One took a drag from the cigarette and passed it back to the other and opened a small book she had in her lap. The girl with the book held it close to her face and fingered through the pages until she said, Here it is. What? What is it? The other girl said. Give me a second, will you? The girl examined the book, then dropped it into her lap and stared at her friend. She said, Dude, this deck is whacked. It's always so right. This card is that you lust for someone you know is evil. The other girl blew smoke out of her nose and clapped herself on the head, her forearm full of bracelets and trinkets clinking and twinkling in the moonlight, and groaned, Oh man, that's Carl. Both girls had long, very dark, unkempt hair, which I assumed was dyed black but could not tell for sure. They both had pale skin and heavy black eyeliner on and very dark lipstick, which might have been black or a very dark shade of purple or red, and they both wore all black clothes. I guessed they were a couple years older than Kate. I liked them immediately and imagined Kate being their friend and going through a safe and uproarious adolescence with them. I even found myself wishing that they might do what they did in front of Kate's stone so that Kate could hear them and have the company, although she was too close to the road and the girls would have been overheard by someone walking his dog who would probably have called the police on his cell phone. I lay still where I was for half an hour while the girls sipped wine and smoked and used their tarot cards as prompts to talk about what was important to them. Their conversation was endearing, although I was embarrassed by a good deal of it, and embarrassed that I was eavesdropping on them. But I did not want to try to sneak away or attempt to rise and act as if I'd stumbled on them by accident. I did not want to frighten or upset them. So I let them chatter and laugh and enjoyed the smell of the smoke from their cigarettes and looked up at the stars and tried to see if I could detect their movement through the sky and thought about Kate watching the whole scene and being amused by it and teasing me about it when we both returned home. Toward midnight, one of the girls said, man, it's almost 12, I gotta go. My parents will be home soon. They'll get all over me if I come in later than they do. The other girl said, yeah, me too. Both girls stood up and stretched and brushed off the backs of their skirts, their bracelets jingling. I heard the cork squeaking back into the mouth of the wine bottle. The girls walked back down the hill, past my family, still talking but more quietly. They passed under the light of a street lamp and into shadow and were gone. If you look at the side of the hill between the sixth and seventh holes of the Enon Golf Club, west of the cemetery, you can still see traces of the foundation of the town's only windmill. The windmill burned down in 1661. Farther down the hill by the road, near the putting green for the tenth hole, stood the house of the father of Sarah Good, who was condemned as a witch and hanged down the road in Salem in 1692, and who famously told her accuser that God would give him blood to drink. I wondered if the girls I had seen in the cemetery knew this. I imagined it would please them, that they'd feel an immediate kinship with her, like Kate always had from the first time I told her about the witch trials, perhaps one that ran deeper than their usual teenage sense of persecution. I read about Sarah Good in an old history of the town, published in 1823 for the town's bicentennial. It was striking that at the time, the author of the book, a man named Barnett Wood, already considered Sarah Good a part of the town's remote history. I like to think about the fact that he wrote his book 175 years before I read it, and that Sarah Good met her fate 131 years before he wrote it. Sarah was hanged in Salem, but there were nights when I passed through the center of the village and imagined her swinging in the wind from a gallows where the Civil War Memorial is, which was originally a green used for common pasturage. The statue standing atop the pediment of the memorial is modeled after a man named Benjamin Conant, who fought in the Union Army and was famous for the grapevines he kept and who repaired shoes before and after the war out of a small shack behind one of the larger houses along Main Street. The shack is still there and is now used as a tool shed by a dentist. Benjamin Conant's statue was erected in 1870 while he was still alive, 47 years after Barnett Wood published his book A History of Enon on the occasion of its bicentennial. 
178 years after Sarah Good was hanged in Salem, 30 years after the first Crosby settled in Enon, and 135 years before my daughter was buried half a mile up the street. In fact, Barnett Wood and Benjamin Conant are both buried in the cemetery as well. I don't know where Sarah Good was buried, maybe in Salem. I never looked it up. But the woods of Enon are full of very old, unmarked graves, and hers may well be among them, along with the bones of animals and citizens, sheep and dogs, fathers and brothers, oxen and horses, mothers and aunts, pigs and chickens, sons and daughters, anonymous cats and owls, Puritans and Indians and unnamed infants, getting their bones mixed in the currents of soil and groundwater, migrating beneath the foundations of our houses and the fairways of the golf courses, trading ribs and teeth and shins and knuckles, commuting under baseball diamonds in the beds of streams, snagging up on roots and rocks, shelves of granite and seams of clay. There are certainly more citizens of Enon beneath its 5,400 acres than there are above it. Just beneath our feet on the other side of the surface of the earth, there is another subterranean Enon, which conceals its secret business by conducting it too slowly for its purposes to be observed by the living. So one of the things that um, Charlie spends much of the novel doing is um, taking those layers, those different strata of the town's history, and superimposing them all together and then taking the memory of his daughter Kate and sort of repatriating her as a citizen among all the ghosts of the town's past. And um, I, I think of that as a kind of emotional and psychic, psychological tactic that he um, uses, um, kind of along the lines of like, Perseus and Medusa, you know, if you look at the Medusa, if you look at the, tra if he looks at the tragedy of his daughter's death directly, he'll turn to stone, he won't be able to survive it, but if he takes her, her memory and mediates it through these little stories and metaphors and versions of her that he makes up for her, somehow he might be able to negotiate the loss, like Perseus looking through the mirror at Medusa, so this is just um, later in the book, and this is one of the, one of the versions of um, Kate that he, that he um, imagines. The obsidian girl moves through the trees at night. She moves across the fairway of the golf course near the road by the stone wall that acts as the hood for the footlights to a kind of stage. She is all but invisible, the girl of black glass, appearing only as a wobbly blur. She is a dark lens. Through her, the dark underpinnings of the world are visible, but they turn whoever might see them to stone or to ice or to salt or to marsh grass. Every night just before dawn, she climbs down into the hill through a hidden trap door. She sounds like a crystal decanter rolling along the granite seams that lead down to the heart of the hill where a furnace burns all day and all night and dark, vague men shovel coal into its white-hot mouth. When the girl made of black glass appears, the men lean their shovels against the walls of the chamber and retreat into the shadows. The girl steps in front of the furnace and the heat roars out and over her like a shimmer shimmering hurricane. She tilts her head back and holds her hands out at her sides. The heat blasts at her and the tips of her fingers begin to glow. The outlines of her face and arms and legs begin to buckle and kink. Her legs give it the knees and the rest of her slides off them and drops in front of them. She remains upright for a moment, but then she topples face first onto the dirt floor in front of the open furnace. It appears as if she is sinking into the dirt at first, but she is actually melting. The glass girl is melting. The glass held the shape of a girl only while it was cool, but now it is molten and pools over the floor. There is no way to tell if the glass leaks out of the girl or if the girl leaks out of the glass. There is a sound that no human ear can hear, coming from a place no human eye can see, from deeper within the earth, but also from deep in the sky and the water and inside the trees and inside the rocks. 
The sound is a voice coming from deep inside the throat of the world. The sound is a note from a register so low that it cannot be heard, but many people throughout the town are disturbed from their sleep by it. It is a note from a song, the shape of which is too vast ever to know. It encompasses and sustains all that is human, but is not loyal to the human, only to what is latent within the human, and it terrifies. The note is a part of great vaulted cathedrals of chords that keep the universe speeding out from its own genesis. It is sensate, and down in the chamber of the hill it sounds both like weeping and like laughter, and both are at the grief of the glass girl who throws herself in front of the fires every morning just before dawn and who to her unending despair is remade every evening in a deeper foundry and evicted from the depths of the hill back to the surface where the cool air flowing through the grass cools and sets her glass eyes and her glass brow, her glass brains and her glass heart and she begins another night as the brittle memories of a man who is the father of a girl she never was. So that's a little beach reading for next summer. For you. My, next, my next project is a musical comedy. <laughs> All right, so I'll just read one more little bit because this is, it's, uh, well, it's interesting to me. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a whole chapter. It's one page. It's almost dead center in the middle of the book. And um, it's kind of a, kind of a perfect little encapsulated portrait of Charlie and his predicament um, as he's trying to uh, get himself out from the undertow of losing his daughter. There's a little bit of gratuitous drug use. That's a guarantee or a, an apology, depending on your disposition. Late one winter night after the new year, which came and went without my being aware of it for two weeks, after I had lost track of how much whiskey I had drunk and how many pills I had crushed and snorted. I lapsed into a blackout and awoke nearly frozen in the cemetery six hours later. I was laid out on my side, stopped up against the backs of three closely laid headstones for three sisters who had all died on December 12, 1839 at eight, seven, and five years old. I was sure that my toes and fingers had frostbite by the wind and the barest light in the east, I could tell that it must be after five in the morning. The sky was still full of stars, but they were not the limpid, tame stars of an early summer evening. They were cold, wild, staring, and ferocious. They were stars that had arrived in Enon's sky from the deepest trenches of space, from terrible, unimaginable beginnings, their light democratized by the present moment, but in fact a vast tangled thicket of times, of ghosted universes haunting the hillside with their artifacted light. Their light unsettled me the way the open eyes of a dead person would, because it is impossible to believe that open eyes do not see. Their light blazed in the eyes of Enon's dead for a moment in false resurrection. I rose and convulsed from the cold and wretched from the poison. I looked over at the snow-covered golf course where kids sledded every winter and imagined the dead having sledding parties at midnight on the back slope of the hill, warming their finger bones in blue fires that they kindled in granite urns, laughing when they held their hands inside the flames. I imagined them melting clumps of dirty ice in a tin bucket over the fire and drinking the hot, muddy brew and cackling with glee as it ran off the backs of their jawbones and spattered down their ribs. I imagined them using headstones for sleds. The idea made me nauseated, and I repented of it. I had the urge to go to Kate's stone and kneel in front of it and say, I'm sorry, over and over again, because no matter how much I knew better, I could not stop myself from stepping over the same dark threshold night after night, trying to follow her into the country of the dead in order to fetch her back, even though she visited me in dreams and never left my waking thoughts. Memories of her feeding the birds and practicing running and playing cribbage were not enough. I was ravenous for my child and took to gorging myself in the boneyard, hoping that she might possibly meet me halfway or just beyond, one night if only for an instant. Step back into her own bare feet, 
onto the wet grass or fallen leaves or snowy ground of the living Enon so that we could share just one last human word. So I think that'll be enough of that. <laughs> oh, thank you kindly. Thanks. <laughs> uh, He's a family you, member. He's going to heckle me. Right. Uh, can you tell folks a little bit about how you got into writing and uh, your career in the musician of the Cold Water Platte? <laughs> oh, no. How that evolved? Well, it all must have started when I was eight and I read Faulkner for the first time. No, um, I, um, no, <laughs> in, no, in, in a former life, I was, uh, I was, I was a drummer in a rock band. That's what I did after I got out of college. I spent my 20s touring around sort of North America and Europe as a drummer, but not a musician. I used to, you know, as a drummer, not a, um, and um, someday I'll tell you all the dumb drummer jokes I know, but not tonight. Um, what do you call the guy who follows the band around from town to town? Um, um, and what happened is the band uh, ended up on a hiatus, which <laughs> ended up being permanent, um, during which I decided to try to write a story. I think like a lot of writers, I started off life as a reader, you know, and I, I, I loved reading so much that at a certain point my reading kind of like hit critical mass, and I kind of got the urge to start answering back to my favorite books, to kind of, you know, start having a dialogue in writing with my favorite books. So, um, yeah, I wrote just this absolutely terrible piece of lousy propaganda, you know, just it was awful, and, um, and then uh, signed up for a writing class at Skidmore College, up in Saratoga Springs, and by the luck of the draw, um, my first teacher was the novelist Marilyn Robinson, and uh, and you know so it was just one of those instances where within ten minutes of her walking into the room and sp starting to talk, I just said, "That's the life I want for my brain," um, and and so it just sort of went from went from there inevitably, you know. So yeah, yeah, I ended up, yeah, she was, she taught at the Ira Writers Workshop, and I was so naive about MFA degrees at that point that I thought, state school, she teaches at a state school, I'll go to, that's easy, I can get, you know, like, so, but yeah, I was very, very fortunate to be able to get to go, to, go there and, and study with her, you know, yeah, and I could tell you about stalking her, but that's later, <laughs> we, we all know each other a little bit better, but. did you have a question you wanted, did you want, oh, okay. Uh, well, I've read that uh, the publication of Tinkers was sort of a Cinderella story that you had a lot of trouble getting the book published yeah. initially. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that time period when you were dealing with rejections from publishers and sure. what made you keep going and believe in your work. Yeah, yeah. So it took me forever to get Tinkers published. I, you know, I worked on it and basically had it finished in 2004 um, and sent it out to, you know, a few dozen editors and agents, all of whom with varying degrees of civility or lack thereof said they didn't want to, they didn't want anything to do with the book, you know, ranging from the sort of at that time, you know, the askew sort of like Xerox form, you know, dear Paul Harding, thank you for sending in your novel. It's not for, to these sort of like long, vehement, resentful letters about, you know, like, oh, you know, how do you set art back by a hundred years by writing this book? You know, <laughs> you know. um, and you have to, you know, I kind of, I mean, personally, it was very, very upsetting, but sort of objectively, I kind of figured that's my fair share of artistic rejection. You know, if you're a writer, it's hard to get your book published. If you're a dancer, it's hard to get a good part. If you're a painter, it's hard to get gallery space. You know, it's just, um, and, uh, and I rejected my rejection letters. You know, I got rejection letters saying things like nobody wants to read a quiet, um, metaphysical interior, um, you know, book that's all about, um, you know, birch bark and creek water. And I said, I do. <laughs> you know, I just, I do. You know, um, people, said, nobody wants to read a, a novel that has more than one point of view. I said, I don't want to write it. I don't want to read a novel that doesn't have more than one, except for Enon. Um, but, you know, like, but, you know, at the time, I was just like, no, I like that. I'll, you know. um, and so what I just found is that I just actually those rejection letters sort of like made me sort of, you know, double down on my, on my determination to just write, to, you know, to just to, to not, you know, put sex and car chases and stuff in my books. And, um, and so kind of the silver lining of, uh, you know, it, it, so that all happened in about 2004, and the book didn't get published until 2009. And so the silver lining of, of 2004 to 2009 was that I, I, I had to kind of give myself a good talking to and say, you know, why are you a writer? 
Um, because you may be right, you know, it, you know, being published and making money and having, you know, selling books may not be a part of why you're a writer. So I, I actually sort of learned to make art for art's sake during those four or five years. And that actually was, was what freed me up to just write whatever I felt like writing, you know. And then just by accident, the book got published <laughs> all those years later. I was crying in my beer with a poet friend of mine. You know, poets are great to <coughs> cry in your beer with. And they... Um, and we were just lamenting how tough it was to get published. And um, he just said, oh, I've got a friend in New York City who, you know, you can query him. He runs sort of a, he's, he's a sort of gentleman publisher. And so I sent the book to him and he said, I really like the book, but I don't want to publish it. <laughs> and I said, well, this is why I don't like to do this sort of thing. And he said, but tomorrow night I just happen to be having dinner with a friend of mine who's an author. And she just happens to be bringing a friend of hers who is a, the editor and the publisher of a just formed not for profit literary boutique, um, uh, you know, a boutique literary uh, press that is r that is run solely at the philanthropic pleasure of the alumni of the NYU School of Medicine. And I was like, of course. <laughs> So he said, "Do you mind? You know, do you, do you do you mind if I give her the manuscript?" And at that point, I was like, "That'd be great." You know, we'll, we'll publish fifty copies of it. My mother will buy forty-eight of them. I'll give the other two copies to my sons. You know, with the CDs from my band, like your daddy wrote a book too. You know, just kind of like this. <laughs> uh, and and it just turned out that it was Erica Goldman from Bellevue Literary Press, and she called me up a week later and said, "I want to publish the book." Um, and, you know, I got an advance of $1,000, and there were 3,500 paperback copies in print, and it just sort of, you know, went from there to its, you know, completely ridiculously unlikely worldly career. Um, and so it was just a series of, you know, incredible accidents and, you know, uh, um, strokes of good luck and good fortune and, you know, and grace for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, I mean, so I think it's, you just have to be dogged, because, I mean, who knew the NYU School of Medicine? If she had come, if she had come calling fi the five years before, I would have said, no way. I write literary fiction. And I'm not going to get published by the NYU School of Medicine. <laughs> you know, so it's sort of, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. How did you support yourself? Or what, what was your How did I support myself? Well, I actually taught, um, I taught at Harvard University for eight or nine years, and I taught... Harvard's version of um, freshman composition, which because it's you know Harvard, it was expository writing, you know, and T. S. Eliot got a C plus in it, you know that. Yeah, so <laughs> it's kind of one of those funny things. So I taught that during the day, and then I taught um, fiction writing in, in the extension school for for many years. But yeah, but the, yeah, I mean, it was it was the problem with Harvard is that if you teach there for five or six years, they kick you out. So um, yeah, around the time that. Um, Tinkers had been out for about a year. They, you know, my contract ran out, and I was sort of, you know, just about to have to start paying my mortgage um, with a credit card and, you know, my 1989 Cutlass Sierra wagon, you know, <laughs> like I was held together with duct tape and spit and all that sort of stuff. And um, I'd actually left my, well, I was actually away from my family teaching for one semester at the University of Iowa because I had just financially I had to. Um, and in the middle of that, in the middle of that semester, the um, Tinkers won the Pulitzer. So things started looking up after that, <laughs> precipitously looking up. You know. Thanks for reading. Mm. Um, there was a lot of history in the book, and seemed to be helping the main character deal with a very tragic situation. Right, right. What do you, what do you think history means uh, today? I mean, it was very everything's current and right now, and you had the cell phone with a guy walking by. It sounds like maybe there's some thoughts there, but what do you think history means? Yeah, I think history means everything, you know? I mean, I just think... I mean, I'm sort of obsessed with time. I'm a real metaphysical kind of guy, you know? And um, it's the great mystery, you know? But I'm 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 fascinated. I mean, just, just in terms of time and not so much history, but just, you know, in the first place, I'm, his, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with time because of the way that time concentrates and disperses and accelerates and decelerates and is foreshortened and exploded and all that sort of stuff. Because all of that, I mean, time and the way we experience it is all a function of consciousness. It's all a function of perception. The fact that we have brains, we perceive time that way. And to me, consciousness and perception are the hallmarks of character, which is what I'm interested in when I write fiction you know, experiential, as it were, fiction. Um, 
and I also just love you know the the the, the fact that when you're reading, time is foreshortened. You know, um, when you're reading Milton, you may as well be in the room with Milton. You know, you're con you become contemporary. So that sort of thing. All sorts of different, you know, time and just in general. I used to, lo you know, love the fact that my grandmother, um, who's been dead for, you know, several years now, but she, um, when I'd ask her about her family stories, she'd talk about her grandfather, who was a nurse in the Union Army during the Civil War and knew Walt Whitman. And so it always just blew me away that I was sitting in a room with somebody who had sat in a room who had been, you know, in the Civil War. And so that, that, that kind of history is sort of like suddenly what seems like, remote history is actually immediate. It's right now, it's totally relevant. You're actually living in the middle of it. And so the way that you can, I mean, art is the perfect place to take all these apparently different times and just make them simultaneous. You can do that in your imagination, you know? So I think of character, I think of consciousness and imagination as something like um, quantum physics. It's all, it's all superluminal and it's all simultaneous. And it all influences. It's a, it's as if it's not separated by linear time. It's all it all sort of exists all, all at once. Where something more like plot is more like Newtonian physics, you know, where it's like every 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 effect B has to have a cause A. It's it's a little bit more mechanical, you know. So I mean, I just think history is just crucial. I mean, I experience history as contemporary, you know, as the present in a way, you know, Faulkner said it's not, you know, the past is not even past, you know, that, that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. I was just curious about uh, what's your, uh, what's your writing routine? What's my writing routine? So this is, yeah, I, it's, um, it's a cliche question. I know. No, it's not cliche at all. It's really important, especially if um, there are writers in the house, you know, um, uh, because there's a real, it's, it's a huge issue when you're teaching writing and when you're learning writing, because the danger is, sitting up at the front of the seminar table teaching writing, the temptation is to teach the way that you get things down on the page as normative, right? And the temptation from the other side of the seminar table is to find a version of that kind of normative process that sounds good to you and adopt it because you've realized how difficult writing is and it would be really nice if there was one way to do it, you know? So a lot, of, but, but the, the thing is though, the trick about writing is you just get it down on the page any way that you can. So I had a lot of very strict, um, you know, uh, writing teachers who said, you know, you get up every single day, you get your cup of black coffee and you sit down and you face the blank page, you know, and like you just sit there, you know, and even if you write nothing, you just sort of just it's an act of mortification. I was like, the hell with that, man. I'm going to go watch a baseball game or something, you know, like I go for months on end where to all appearances I'm napping. <laughs> You know, usually with like some impressive looking book. You know, like, oh. <laughs> and what I do is I actually, I, I've arranged my house so that I have lots of nice couches all around the house and I have piles of books in all of the rooms in my house. So like it's, a, um, you know, like that old game Clue. You know, like I go to the den, the southwest corner of the den and there's Proust and I get on the couch and I read 10 pages and I fall asleep. And, and then and I get up and I, like, I'm a cat. I follow the sun around the house. So I go from Proust to like, oh, here's some philosophy of physics. Here's some theology. Here's some. And what I do is I just sort of get into these half sleeping states and I just ride the updrafts in which everything I'm reading just sort of intermingles and everything. And then after four or five months, I sit up and go, oh, and I start. And, and then I'll write, you know, 1500 words a day for two months, you know, and then I'll just like fall back asleep. <laughs> I says, what are you doing? I'm working. I'm an artist, you know. Um, so it's it's um, I, I think it's it's you know basically you know present company et cetera you know like w unless you're talking shop among writers you know once you get out of writers talking shop and you just get into the world of people reading books forgive my French but nobody gives a shit how you wrote your book all people care about is that they have a beautiful work of art in their hands you know what I mean and they I mean I, I, subsequently it might be interesting biographically to know how how an author wrote a book, but really you shouldn't have to need to know how an author wrote a book to have the book like blow your mind, you know? And that's, I'm sorry, that, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing a, uh, um, a, a musician named Jeff Lynn who actually told that to a guy named Tom Petty, who may, you may have heard of. Um, Tom Petty was very strident and righteous about how he used to make his albums and finally this guy, Jeff Lynn, just had to say, Tom, nobody cares, nobody cares, you know? Make a good, uh, make a great record. Cool. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> kind of my <laughs> John, you I was um, really upset when I read this mm. at Charlie's lack of a support system. Mm. It really bothered me, and yeah. it made me think, is that the way you see life? Like, if that happened to you, <laughs> would you just be abandoned by everyone? No, I know, life? yeah. And it, it really bothered me. I mean, it, it hurt, you know, Yeah, yeah poor yeah. Charlie. Sure, yeah, poor so Charlie, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, part of, you know, part of, the, you know, the first time, when I first got the idea for the book, my first instinct was to run for the hills. You know, because I just thought, this is so tragic, it's so intense, it's practically impossible to write. But then as a kind of a, you know, as a, in terms of quality control and artistic discipline, that's when the better part of me said, well, that's exactly why you should need to try to write the book. I mean, I always feel best when I feel like the project I'm working on, I'm not a good enough writer to write. And that the only way to become good enough is to try to write it. Um, so, I mean, part of it was just dealing with like such a tragic, stark, tragic foreground. How can you get all the other dimension, dimensions of a work of art and of, of, a, of this guy's life in, in into the book? I mean, that became Charlie's problem. You know, his problem is my problem. Um, the way I see it, I mean, there's a couple of different layers to Charlie being isolated. The very first, since it's, it's a first person narrative, um, the very first is that I mean, just sort of technically the way the book came to me was as a monologue, as a soliloquy. It was almost like St. Augustine's confession. It was always going to be one voice. You're quietly sort of in the dark and you're listening to this one voice trying to account for himself. Because most of the book, you know, Charlie has a conscience and most of the book he's doing things that he thinks he shouldn't be doing. And that's a very universal human experience, you know, from the most mundane, trivial examples like I shouldn't eat the chocolate cake, <laughs> I shouldn't smoke a cigarette to the most morally profound, I shouldn't leave my brother by the wayside, I shouldn't, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. It's like St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the evil that I do not wish to do is what I do, and the good that I mean to do is that which I do not. I think that's very recognizable. So that's, that was kind of what I was watching him and listening to him negotiate. Um, I have children. The first time I became a parent, when my first ch my first son was born, was the first time in my life I thought, you know something, something could happen. If something ever happened to him, it's the first time in my life where I thought, I will just go out into the backyard, I will dig a hole, I will crawl in it, and I will cover myself over, and I'll just die. I'll just curl up and die. Um, it's also the case that I have several very, very close friends who have lost children, only children in some cases, um, and two or three of them lost only children while I was writing the book. Um, and so again, kind of, you know, general principle too is why bother being an artist if your art is not going to have less than everything at stake when you're writing, you know, write about the most difficult things, the most irreducible things, write about the things that when you're up at four in the morning, worried about your friends who've lost children and worried about the universe, write about those things. Um, so I gave Charlie, the reaction that I gave to Charlie was what I thought my own would be, which would be like, I don't want anybody coming. I, if you knock on the front door with a casserole, I'm not going to answer it. I'm, I'm absolutely going to, like, I'm just going to curl up and die. But then the reason why the book is called Enon is the, uh, the town and the village is a character in the book. And even though all of the book is funneled through Charlie's point of view, the town is actually taking care of him. But the town that I grew up in would not impose itself explicitly. It would be, it's what I think of as difficult or as weird or as kind of, you know, by any other name you wouldn't call it that, but I think of the town as being tactful. So he's loyal to the town. He doesn't flee the town when his daughter dies. He stays with the town. He goes deeper into the town and its history. He uses the town to negotiate the memory of his daughter. And it turns out at the end that the whole town knows he's doing that and everybody sort of actually being very solicitous of him and letting him go through his own experience of the loss of his daughter, you know, so long, as, you know, I mean, they would intervene if it became, a, you know, worse than it did. But I thought of it as just like the town that I grew up in would have been like that. They would, they would have just, if that, I think of it, I think of it as tact, you know? Um, and I think that's the thing about grief and about community and all those sorts of things is, it's easy to read the book and wish for more, but but the, the, what you what you wish for and what actually ha you know when grief happens, it's such a personalized thing, um, and just that's what I kind of felt like I was loyal to to, to 
Charlie, in this case, telling me what his experience was, rather than me taking some sort of theoretical or, or rhetorical or generalized idea of what grief is, and then forcing him into that boilerplate version of it, you know? So you take, like, who's it, like Kubler-Ross or whatever? You know, chapter one, denial, check. You know, and then you just sort of cram him through, as opposed to just me as a writer quieting down, opening my ears, opening my eyes, and just listening to what he said sentence by sentence. This is how I'm trying to improvise my way through every single moment because it never goes away and I don't know how to get out from under it and I don't know what to do and I know that my reaction is not equal to the memory of my daughter, but here I am drinking whiskey, here I am abusing you know, uh, painkillers, here I am breaking into my neighbor's house to steal theirs and, he, you know, and just... I became more and more loyal to him. So I just, you know, said, okay, I'm just going to go with you. I'm going to go. And, you know, halfway through the book, I was like, isn't it time to start turning back up? Isn't it? Isn't it? And he's like, we're not even halfway down, you know? And the only thing I knew at the beginning of making the book was that the book was not going to be hopeless, that the book was not going to end in his death or his suicide or anything like that. I would never, ever write a book that was hopeless. So he comes, you know, he's skidding right up to the edge of it. And then, again, as an artist, just sort of aesthetically, I was interested in the principle of just contrast and juxtaposition, the idea that the deeper and more profound the darkness, the more beautiful and piercing and heartbreaking the light will be, even if it's just the smallest amount of light at the end, it will be all the more piercing in contrast to the darkness out of which it breaks. You know, and I, so I just knew that was going to happen, but I didn't know how. I just knew that it was going to be a tiny amount of, it was going to be as small as it was and as costly as it was and as modest as it was, the book was still going to end with real and true and authentic hope, you know, so. All right, great, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, I really love both oh, the books. Thank you kindly. And uh, I was uh, reading an interview recently in which you said, and I'm paraphrasing, um, that some of the advice that you offer your students is to, as you know, writers or aspiring writers, to really take a look at the long game, mm -hmm. and to you know not necessarily fall prey into the cycle of you know needing to publish right away. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you could talk maybe just a little bit more about the tension between you know wanting to have something that you're really proud of and the pressure, whether it's internal or external, you know, of needing to feeling like you need to publish. Yeah, I mean, I, I th you know, all of my best teachers always talked about um, the how crucial it is not to mix up writing with publishing. They're just not the same thing. Writing is not a means to anything else. Writing is the thing itself. Publishing is wonderful. I mean, after all, making a book or any kind of a work of art is essentially a gesture of fellowship, right? You want other people to, you know, it's a, you know, you say, here, read this and recognize something of your own, of our own common human experience. But at the same time, I, what I found is that when you write books, unless you're writing like genre fiction, you know, genre fiction is written um, in, or, you know, people read genre fiction because they know what's going to happen. You read it to be comforted. You read it because your fur is going to be rubbed. But sort of more like, as it were, literary fiction, which sounds, I hate that term, but, but when I, like my working definition of, the, of what literary fiction means is simply fiction that is inspired and motivated by having read other literature. So that's all I mean by that. Um, I mean, because there's no such thing as pure genre. There's no such thing as pure literary fiction. Every book sort of has intermingled aspects of it that change within, within the book a lot. Um, but when I write, all of the outside world has to go away. I, I, can't, I can't worry about the editor. I can't worry about the publisher. I can't worry about the reader. And like, what I find is actually the deepest solicitude you can have for your reader is not to try to second guess what she wants. You know what I mean? It's just you have to write the kind of book you'd like to read. You have to try to write the very best thing, the, the very best book that you can. And the, the almost the only authority never mind the best authority about uh, uh you know on what constitutes the integrity of a work of art is the work of art itself the work of art is its own best authority on its own integrity and what needs to be done so it's just always f you know focusing on that and then if you you know get to the point where you write something that you like and then you have a editor 
who you trust, um, who uh, you can listen to and take advice from, uh, and, you, and and again you trust her, but you don't, um, uh, but you're not um, too obstinate. Like I won't change anything. Um, and once you get like the book that you meant to write in between two covers, then it switches over from art to show business. Kind, I mean, not re not really, but you know, like. Um, and it's nice. I mean, I find it kind of this nice, it's almost dialectical or something, you know, like I spent, you know, three years basically sort of in my house, you know, writing Enon, you know, and I hear, you know, like uh, look around the curtain out the window, like, is that the mailman? You know, like I become crazy. I'm just like agoraphobic and out of my trees. Um, and then I get to go out and come and talk to you guys and hang out and I get, you know, super extroverted. And then, you know, <laughs> this is actually the last night of a 12 week book tour that I've been on. So I'm going to go home and my wife's going to say, sit, stay in the corner, be quiet. And I'm going to be like, let's go, it's showtime. And then, like, and then I'll gear down from that and then start reading and napping again and then start building up, hopefully, you know, what'll, what'll be book number three. And I mean, the beautiful thing about being a writer is unlike a lot of other, you know, things like sports or say like mathematics or whatever, you don't get put out to pasture when you're 25. You know what I mean? Like you like it's sort of you get more and more seasoned, you accumulate experience, you accumulate perspective. And that's all a virtue, you know, being being an artist. And so I don't know. I think it's I mean, in some ways, it's easy for me to say because, it, you know, it. You know, take 20 years to become a writer and you'll win a Pulitzer. You know, I mean, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> but but, you know, t both of the books I've published, I'm happy, you know, like I will I will not disown them. I will not disavow them, you know, and I was able to, um, you know, I've just had the good fortune of with both, you know, both publishers and both editors and everybody I've worked with. They've just given me all the time and the space that I've needed. Um, because I'd read, you know, with a third book, I have a contract. I'm legally obligated obligated to deliver a third book. Um, but I, you know, I, my editor, sh if it turns out that it takes ten years to write that book, she won't be happy, you know. She, um, but but she'll let me do it. And I and I'd much rather, you know. Um, uh, I mean, I don't mean to be morbid or whatever, but I'd rather die with two or three really good books under my belt than like seven or eight that like are out there just because I was able to get them published. You, you, you know, um, and so and it changes, you know, the balance changes and sometimes you write a book quickly and sometimes you write a book slowly and sometimes, you know, it's sort of and sometimes you do just have to take an opportunity. If you have an opportunity to get published, you have to really sort of consult with your own soul and and, and, and sort of think about it. But you don't, never publish just for the sake of getting a byline, you know, at least at least with this, you know, these kind of books. You know, so. Thank you. You're most welcome. So we good. Well, oh, well, thank you all. Thank you kindly.